Uh, so yeah, so I'm a, a research scientist at Columbia University, and I'm a co-founder of Basis. And I couldn't think of a good title, so I just sort of model based reason in which encompasses some of the things that I'll talk about. So just to give some high level motivation, um, so this is the James Webb Telescope, uh, and it's composed of 18 different mirrors controlled by 132 different actuators built by hundreds or thousands of scientists over the last few decades. Uh, and it's allowed us to create these images, which I, I think may, maybe many of you have seen over the last few days. And so, you know, I'm not taking a, a sharp left turn into astrophysics. My interest in uh, this, you know, in this is like, what is it about human minds that allows us to uh, understand, you know, like understand the universe and also to build such kind of amazing devices uh, in, in large teams and, uh, you know, build upon this foundation of, of mathematics and physics and physical know-how uh, to construct these, these devices. And I don't know the, the answer, of course, but I think uh, even if you go down to children, you know, uh, children build, build things and they, and they build models of the world. And so a lot of my work is taking inspiration from humans, adults and children to try to understand some principles by which we can learn to discover how the world works. So today I'm gonna to talk about uh, a bunch of different projects, all at a pretty high level. Uh, the first two are uh, with students, both of whom are here, and the last two are actually older, but more incomplete projects that I did during my PhD. Uh, but I think they'll be fun to share because may maybe some of you can give some ideas about how to push them forward. So this first project is, is called Autumn, and this is in collaboration with uh, Ria Das, uh, who's here, and Armando and Josh. And the basic idea behind this project is to try to understand or, or build a simple model of causal or theory discovery. And so I'm going to start with this domain. I think the, the Zoom has messed things up. So let me just try and fix that. Okay, cool. Okay, so Armando asked me to make this a little bit interactive. And so uh, I'm going to show you this autumn domain. And autumn is both a language and a compiler and a domain of different uh, environments and also a kind of a benchmark, benchmark suite. And so I'll, I'll just show you one example, a very simple example, this first, this first example. So I'm just going to compile it. And I can see my mouse, which is very small. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have the code, which just defines the autumn environment. And on the right-hand side, we have this arcade-like environment. Uh, and so this code is uh, what's you know, running in the background, which is caused in what we see on, on, on the right-hand side. And so this is a very simple model. Um, you can't see where I'm clicking, but basically I click and some particle appears and it moves according to some kind of random, random motion. And the high level goal of the autumn project is to observe this environment in the way that you are right now and to figure out the code on the left hand side, which is underlying that environment. So just to take another example, uh, maybe a more complex one, and now I'm going to ask for some uh, audience participation. If you will entertain me with that. And so what I would like to do is both to demonstrate the environment, but also to do a kind of population based Bayesian inference, right? And so what I want you to do is to maybe raise your hand when you feel like you have a good understanding of how this environment works. So like if your hand is like really high up, that means you fully understand how the world works. And if it's like halfway, then maybe you're, you're still uncertain. And if it's like down, you have no idea about what's going on in this environment. And it's not a trick, it's, it's, it's just a, a simple uh, dynamical system, uh, and, but we can see how it evolves over time. So I'm just gonna run this. Um, Okay, so does anybody know how this works? Well, I know some people know how it works because they do. Um, but if I if I click, oops, this is okay. If I click, I can tell you when I'm clicking. So presumably you've learned something, right? Perhaps just that clicking, you know, causes something to to to, to happen. So a little bit, like maybe a few half hands are going up. Okay. Um, So maybe I'll ask for some participation. Like, what should I do next? Say again? Okay, I'm gonna, which one? Orange one? Okay, I'm gonna click, I click the yellow one. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm gonna click some more. Okay, click the blue one. Okay, click the and I click again. Okay. Ah. But it is that kind of aha 
insight which you want to be able to capture. But I don't see any like fully stretched arms, so maybe there's still some amount of uncertainty. Anything else I should do? Pick the black one? Okay. There's a kind of pattern in these instructions. Again, the black. Okay, I picked it. Sorry? Something else before I click on the red. Okay. Can you click on the, the, the white just above the blue? The white just above the blue. Like here? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that what you expected? <laughs> so it still seems like there's a fair amount of uncertainty. I don't see any fully arms stretched. Click on the red one. Oh, click on the red. Around the blue box with the purple. I don't know how to make a box of purple, like a okay, demanding. Is that sufficient? And then what? Okay, just one special blue one. <laughs> What happens if there's a yellow the way of the blue drop it? What are we making? Uh, <laughs> like this? Okay. What? But like if you put on a purple square. Yeah. Any any square. Oh, I see. On top. Yeah. Okay. I did that. So what happens if you run gray now? Gray? Yeah. yeah. So is anybody fully confident about how the world works? Okay, so we've got a fair number of hands. Yeah, and so um I think you pretty much covered all of the dynamics, maybe to give a little bit more context. And I'll just reset this, reset this world and run it again. Oops. So this, this environment we call water plug. And so conceptually we think of this as a little bit like a sink. Um, and that orange thing is a plug. But again, there's no tricks. Like you press the, the gray thing and the, and the orange thing disappears, the plug disappears. The blue is a little bit like water. Um, and so our goal is to kind of do what you just did, uh, to observe somebody interacting with this world and to figure out the dynamics underlying the world, which is the program on the left-hand side. And it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's obviously a simplified domain, uh, but you can encode lots of rich and interesting dynamics in this kind of simple uh, grid world. Okay, so. Okay, so I'm just going to give a high level overview of the autumn language that, that runs these domains. Uh, it's a simple reactive, functional reactive language uh, designed for these uh, two dimensional grid worlds. And so we have these object types, which just define objects and uh, kind of the geometric uh, shape of those objects and their position uh, or the origin in space. And then what we have are, um, oops, so here, so here, is the, here is the structure. So we have some objects, some type name, and then some. A set of cells which define how the object is structured. And then we have what's called a stream definition. And so a stream definition is a little bit like a recurrence relationship, which you would write in normal mathematics, the, the value at time t and the value at time t plus one. Oops. Then we have what we call on clauses. And so these are basically interventions. So they say on some event occurring, apply some intervention to the world or, or apply some change. And so that's basically the autumn language. It's very simple. Uh, one of the things that we have in autumn is that we can look back into the history, the previous values, and so we can make the current state a function of uh, the past, the past states, just in the same way that you would write a recurrence relation in math. And the goal is to synthesize these programs. So if you think in a forward direction, 
we have this program uh, and you know that's running some kind of interpreter with some inputs from the user and we want to go to, you know, do the kind of the backwards direction to infer the program uh, given some observations through time. And so our, our, our algorithm uh, and when I say our, all of you know all or much of this work is done by Ria Das who's here uh, has these four components. The first component is to uh, pass this the scene into objects uh, and object types. So we have a heuristic algorithm which passes uh, you know pulls out the objects in the scene. And the next phase is for every consecutive time step to find a correspondence between different objects, right? And so these arrows are showing that at some, you know, this is on the left-hand side, we have, on the left-hand side, we have time t, on the right-hand side, we have time t plus one. And we want to say that this object in time t corresponds to this object in time t plus one. And we do that for all of the objects, also accounted for objects might appear uh, when they didn't exist before, and they also might kind of disappear. And then the next stage is what we call update function synthesis, and that is to find an autumn expression for every uh, transformation of an object that describes in the autumn language that transformation. So, for example, the top arrow might be uh, associated with a, a kind of a move, a, a move left transformation, and this bottom arrow might be associated with associated with a, a move right transformation. And then we have a whole library of different primitive operations which we could try to associate with these, with these arrows. And to do that association, we we first construct what we call an uh, an abstract uh, update matrix. And the basic idea behind, sorry, behind this matrix is for every time step, we have one column, and then for every row, we have an object. And for every cell in this matrix, we're defining a set of possible transformations which could account for the data. So for example, for object three, at time step three, we have uh, both next liquid and next solid. And those are both valid candidate expressions which would define how object three translates between time step three and time step four. And the following step is to translate this or to concretize this abstract matrix from being a set of possible transformations into being a single uh, potential transformation. Um, and there's many different ways that you could concretize this matrix. You could you know, choose arbitrarily from these different cells. And but what we want to do is basically you know, find a, a good, plausible, concrete matrix. And so we construct an ordering of these uh, concrete matrices. Uh, and we order them, you know, I won't go so much into the details, but at a high level, uh, we favor update functions which appear throughout the, the, the entire matrix on a type level. So for example, if we go back and look at object three, uh, we see that uh, ultimately we choose next solid, and that's because next solid uh, appears more often within the type of that object. And so this is a heuristic, you could think of it as a prior, uh, which kind of encodes some uh, you know, things that we think are true about the world uh, and allows us to basically find good programs uh, earlier. And so at this point, uh, we have basically the, a, a partial program. We have, for every object type, we have uh, kind of a type definition, its physical form, its kind of initial dynamics, and then we have an update function which describes how that object, how that object is transformed through time. But what's missing are the events which trigger this transformation. So as you saw when I was interacting, I clicked and that caused something to, something, something to occur. And so what we have to find out now are what are those events which are associated, associated with those update functions being applied. To do that, we, we do a kind of a search for events. And so an event in this context is some predicate which is true over the program state at some particular time. And so we have a library of primitive events and they could be global events, for example, um, that the user clicked or they could be uh, you know, two objects are close together or intersecting, or they could be object specific events like this object is the color red. And so essentially we, we look at our set of primitive events and we can evaluate their values over time. Uh, and so in this case, you can see that you know, the, the user pressed down at time set one, two, and three, uh, and also uh, that, the, that the, the, the color of the sun was yellow at times, I don't know, seven, eight, and nine. Right. Um, and so what we want to do is find some correspondence between the events that exist uh, in our library and also the update functions when they occur or, or don't occur. In this case, these primitive events by themselves are not sufficient to explain why, for example, an object was added. And so we have to find a conjunction uh, or disjunction of different events to account for the data. And so we use an SMT solver. Well, there's, there's a few different ways, but one of the ways is to use an SMT solver to find logical combinations and and ors of these primitive events. Uh, to find some composite event which would match the occurrence of any particular update function. And so with that, we've basically got all, the, you know, in, in the simplest case, we've got all of the ingredients 
uh, that we need to synthesize the program. We've got the update functions, which are which, de which define on every object how it's transformed, and we can find the events associated with applying those update functions. But one of the kind of the hardest things about these domains is the existence of latent state. And so to, to, to give a, a demonstration of latent state, let me try and find my mouse again. Okay, here we go. So this is a, a kind of a simple, almost like Mario-like simulation. So we have this character, we can move up and down. And kind of the interesting thing about this is that we can collect these coins. And when I press down, it shoots, or when I, sorry, when I click, it shoots this bullet, right? Um, and kind of the thing about this domain is that the number of bullets that I have in my, in my store is kind of, you know, what I've picked up through by collecting the coin. So there's like one coin per bullet. So money directly transfers into bullets in this world. Now, you know, I shot a bullet, so now I don't have any left. And if I try to shoot again, nothing will happen. So when I click, nothing happens. And so this is kind of a hard problem from a synthesis perspective, because I've got two different scenes, which are observationally equivalent. Uh, but when I, when I click in one scene, but it appears, and when I click in the other scene, nothing happens. And the difference is the existence of latent state, which is saying, do I have bullets in my, uh, in my rep repertoire, or sorry, in my repository or not. And so one of the, you know, that's an example of one of the challenging problems here, which is how do we figure out that we have some kind of latent state that, that is necessary to explain our data? And so the approach that we take is as follows. So, uh, so we, 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 again, we look for these events, uh, and we try to find the best possible event, which may not be perfect in the sense it may not coincide exactly with the uh, update function that we're interested in. So in this particular example, the update function we're interested in is the addition of a bullet to this environment. Um, and you can see that I've clicked on this top row, here's where I've clicked. And on the second row, I don't know what this, um, oh, let's zoom. Um, uh, sorry, in the second, on the second row is when I've clicked. And on the first row is uh, when the object has been added and they're not in perfect correspondence. And so I need to construct some latent variable, which will essentially describe the difference uh, between uh, what I've observed, or basically, you know, uh, the occurrence of the click events and the occurrence of uh, the objects being added. And so it's, it's kind of at a high level, it's saying, well, I can't explain my data fully from my, from my observations. So there must exist something in the world which would account for the difference. And if that, if that something existed, here are the values that it would take, right? Here's when it would be true, uh, when I need it to be true. And so we construct this almost hypothetical event, which is I clicked and some, and some other thing occurred at these times, and this, con this conjunction would be a valid event, which would explain uh, you know, the, the full dynamics of you know, bullets being added to the scene. And so now we have this kind of hypothetical observed latent variable, but it's just a bunch of data, and we want that to generalize through time and through space. And so kind of the final step is to construct an automata which accounts for the sequence of, of time steps. But high, high level, that's the algorithm. And you know, we can go into some more of the details you know, later if you wish. But the cool thing is that you know, it works. And so we can, we can uh, pass kind of sequence of frames to, this, to our system and it can synthesize uh, you know, the programs that I showed you, to, showed you so far in their entirety with the objects, with the transformations, with, you know, with the latent state. Uh, and we can do that for you know, a, a subsite a sizable set of programs. Uh, we have this benchmark suite, which we call CISC, the causal inductive synthesis corp causal inductive synthesis corpus. And we were able to synth synthesize like you know relatively large programs uh, through this process. And so you know this is again this is a very artificial domain, but I think there are some really interesting uh, uh, kind of insights from that. So one is is this idea of decomposition. We don't try and solve this entire problem all at once. We decompose it into objects and we solve these subproblems. Uh, two is the discovery of latent state. And three is this kind of error correction. So we, you know, we try to explain the data, we can't fully do it. And so we, we say, well, there must be some other reason uh, why we can't explain our data. And so we try to account for that through the existence of latent state. Yeah, so, so 
So that's, that's the other project, and we have a paper on the submission. You know, please ask me, Aria, if you have any questions about this you know, any, any time. So I'm going to move gears to a, a different project, which is in some deep sense related, but also much more on the, on the neural side of things. And that is a project with Marlene, Marlene Burke, who's also here. And this is around metacognition. So I'm going to show you a short video. Well, it's a long video, but I'll show you a short segment of it. Um, and so this is a, a video that Marlene sent me, and it's a car. Uh, you know, driving down, as you can see. And as you can see, it's, it looks like there's water in the road, right? But there's not actually water in the road. And as you, you know, as the car goes forward, uh, you realize that there can't be water in the road. And so there's two things going on here. So your low level visual system is saying, well, there's water here, that's what I see. But your, 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 you know, your high level cognition is saying, well, that can't be true based on everything else I know about how the world works, right? It can't be, it can't be the case that water is just somehow rapidly evaporating as soon as I get close. And so what we wanted to explore is this notion of metacognition. We have some low-level perceptual you know, module and some high-level cognition, which can, uh, in some sense, modulate that module. So, you know, we, we explore this in a, in a more restricted domain, and that's object recognition. And so on the left-hand side, you have a bunch of uh, images, and these images uh, are classified uh, through an off-the-shelf object recognizer. And this object recognizer takes an image and it classifies you know, where the objects are in space, put in a 2D frame or 2D position uh, uh, around each, each object. And as you can see, it makes some mistakes. So in this case, it might uh, uh, miss some of the objects, it might miss the umbrella, or it might miss the plant. Uh, and so our goal is to you know, instantiate this idea of metacognition by essentially trying to build a model of the errors of the perceptual model. So like try to understand uh, in what ways the, the, the perceptual model makes mistakes. And so in this case, the particular kinds of mistakes we're, we're considering are hits and misses. So it might include something which doesn't actually exist in the world, or it might miss something uh, uh, which you know, should exist in the world. And we construct a kind of a probabilistic model over that. And so the basic setup is this kind of probabilistic you know, hierarchical model with the neural network as a subcomponent of that model. And so, I'll just go through very quickly the structure. So at the start, we have this scene generator. And so we generate probabilistically three-dimensional scenes, some unknown number of objects. Those objects are placed in some you know, locations randomly around the scene. And then we have a rendering process which takes those objects and produces an image. This is an artificial renderer. And then the, those images are passed into a neural network, right? And so uh, this, is, this is the off-the-shelf neural network that we've taken. And we're, we're making the assumption that our neural network is the composition of some true object detector and some, some kind of noisy process which introduces noise to the end. And so our goal is to do posterior inference. So we're going to say that we have, we have we've observed the output. And uh, when I say the output, these observations, I mean literally the objects are at these positions at different times. And what I want to do is basically find the posterior belief about the true scene uh, such that I can now predict better object recognitions for some new image. So to express that in math, uh, we have the, the scene, the world, W. Uh, we have V, which is our kind of our error matrix, which describes this hit and miss uh, dynamic. And then we have our observations that we're conditioning on. And also we have our camera coordinates, which are you know, where we're looking at the scene. And so this is kind of our, our Bayesian posterior. And the thing is, that if we can find the posterior belief over V and W, we can now do what's called posterior predictive inference and take some new image and classify that. And that basically accounts, amounts to fixing our object recognition system. So, so just to kind of, oops. I'll just skip a few just to show again. And so what we can do just to show on the right-hand side, this is kind of the result after uh, we run this through the system. And so basically we can pick up the objects that we missed and correct these errors. But I'll, I'll go back and, and show some of, the, some of the other results. So there's a few kind of a few cool results. So one cool result is that we can take an off-the-shelf object recognizer and just make it better, essentially, uh, by incorporating it within this probabilistic model. And the main kind of key idea that this model is, is encapsulating is the idea of object permanence, right? The objects remain kind of permanent through time and space, right? So if you see an object from you know, some particular location and then you see it from some other location at some other point in time, it would be like really unlikely that the object just disappeared, right? And by including this probabilistic model where you have this kind of single world on the, on the left-hand side, 
you, in some sense, implicitly capture this notion of object, object permanence. And so on the right-hand side is just a kind of a summary of the results. We can take you know, three pretty you know, well-performing object recognition systems and improve them. And so this is showing the difference between uh, the original object recognition system and the object recognition system incorporated into this larger model with kind of Bayesian inference on top. Um, we show that we can actually recover on the left-hand side the error rates of the neural network pretty well, both in terms of the hits and misses. And so this is showing you uh, the inferred rate as a function of the ground truth rate. And in the middle, we show that basically the more data we observe on, the better our inference, uh, the better our inferences get over time. Okay, so this is again just a summary of the results um, for again these these three models. Just the base level neural network by itself doesn't perform very well, and you know you might ask one question like why is that? Uh, given that neural networks are so good, and the answer is we're really focusing on out of distribution images, uh, cases where neural networks just do pretty pretty poorly uh, in general. And by augmenting it uh, with Metacog, we can show that we can improve the performance uh, by incorporating this domain knowledge about object permanence as a component in a larger level uh, probabilistic model. One cool thing that we can do at the end is to say, well, okay, maybe this isn't quite fair because our system is conditioning on a bunch of images per scene, but a normal object recognition model just takes one input. So maybe it's not, you know, uh, you know, a fair comparison. And so the cool thing is that we can take the inferences from our model, construct a new data set where we've relabeled the images. So for example, uh, this kind of the middle row, originally we missed the umbrella, but through our process, we've now figured out that there wasn't actually an umbrella there. And so we can actually construct an entirely new data set of objects and, the, and their labels, and then fine tune the original object recognition model with this new data set. And so we can just take a off the shelf neural network retrain it with data created through this process and actually just improve the model overall. So here's the comparison of the kind of the, the original pre-trained neural network on a standard object recognition, object recognition task, and then kind of retrain with this additional data that we've taken. It's almost like this retrospective inference data that we've taken, added to our data set and then fine tune the model. And we can just improve the performance overall, both on the original task and also on all, all of the new data. Uh, and you know, these are just some results showing that uh, the error rates go, goes down as a function of uh, the number of observations, uh, and also that the performance goes up as a function of, of the observation, um, as you'd expect. So, so, so this this project is also on the submission, and feel free to reach out if you have if you have more questions to either me or Marlene. And I'm going to again switch gears a little bit to some more uh, some some work that I did again during my PhD, uh, which I think is starting to go in this kind of middle between symbolic and, and the neurosymbolic. So sim symbolic and the neural side. Okay, so one of the things that really interests me is this idea of, uh, of, of program inversion. And the reason I care about program inversion or just to say what program inversion is, we have some model, uh, some, some model F, some program F that computes, uh, takes an input X and outputs Y. And I wanna compute the inverse. I wanna recover uh, the, the input given the output. And I think this idea has come up already a bunch of times implicitly throughout the, throughout the workshop. But you know, here are a few different motivating factors or motivating examples. One is again inverse graphics. I've I've got some rendering process that takes as input some three-dimensional representation of the world, and that renders that to a two-dimensional image. And I want to recover the three-dimensional uh, scene given a two-dimensional image. If we can do that, it'll be useful for robotics and so on. Uh, similarly, for control, uh, I have a kinematic function which says, okay, given some joint angles, where is my hand? And often I want to do the inverse problem. Like I want to know where I should put my joint angles to reach some particular point in space. So the high level goal is to build some kind of program inverter, right? And so this is uh, actually you know, a semi-working system where I write some program on the left-hand side. This is Julia code. I just write some function and I just say, okay, invert that function and give me, you know, give me the output of the inverse. So the first challenge you find with you know, any, you know, any kind of notion of program inversion is like that most things are not invertible, right? Um, so in the case of you know, this, these 3D dynamics, uh, you think you know, the rendering function which goes from 3D to 2D is not invertible because you know, there's many different 3D scenes that create the same 2D output, right? So for example, if I had something behind my back that would create the same 
visual observations for you, but it would be a, a different three-dimensional environment. And so, um, and this happens even in simple things like addition, right? If I tell you that x plus y equals 10, you don't exactly know what you know, x plus y is. Or, sorry, you don't exactly know what x or y is. And so the main idea I had is something I call parametric inversion, which is to construct a parametric representation of the pre-image of any value. So uh, essentially, if I have some function, like for example, addition, uh, I can't invert it, but maybe I can construct some notion of a generalized inverse, right? And so that generalized inverse should recover the kind of the, the, the nice properties of what I get from a normal inverse. I'll just show you by example. So here I have addition, again, f on the left-hand side, f of x and y equals x plus y. And I'm gonna construct this inverse, right? F inverse of Z and theta, and it's gonna return two values, one for X and one for Y. And the X is gonna be Z minus theta and the Y value is gonna be theta. The point here is that Z minus theta plus theta is equal to Z, right? So I've recovered, I've recovered Z. And the second point is that if I vary theta, I get back all the different combinations of X and Y, which will sum to Z. So in other words, this, 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 this inverse is both sound in the sense that it does what I want from an inverse, and it's complete in the sense that I can recover all of the possible uh, uh, x's, x's and y's which could uh, give me z. So a, a different example is uh, the square function, f of x equals x squared. Now my parameter space theta is plus or minus one. If I choose, you know, if I choose theta to be one, I get back the positive root. If I choose theta to be minus one, I get back the negative root. Okay, so, you know, that's just one example, but I wanna do this for more complicated programs. The key idea behind parametric inversion is that I can take a complex program, you know, let's just start with a composition of two programs, uh, let's say the addition function and the square function, so f of x and y equals x plus y squared, and I can apply the following procedure. I take each primitive in that composition, the plus function and the square function, and I replace each primitive with its corresponding inverse primitive, and then I revert the order of the composition. So, you know, as you can see here, plus has gone to minus, so plus has gone to plus to the minus one, uh, square has gone to square to the minus one, as I've just defined, and I've kind of reverted the arrows of the composition. Now, kind of the, the, the kind of the claim or the theorem is that this process is sound in the sense that if I do this for an arbitrary composition, I will get out a parametric inverse of the forward composition, right? So in other words, is that there's a mechanical procedure by which I can take a program and construct a inverse of that program or a parametric inverse of that program. Now, you know, in some sense, I've just made a very strong claim, right? Because we all, maybe we should know that pro program inversion is in general a hard thing to do. So I'm claiming that there's some kind of mechanical transformation, uh, but we know it's a hard problem. So what's going on here? So one of the issues is this issue of partiality. Um, and, and so everything that I've told you so far is true, but it could be the case that on this inverse that I've constructed, some of the values of the parameters are not valid. In other words, it's a partial function with respect to the parameter space. So here's an example. So this function is f of x and y equals x times y plus y. And so you can think of this in this graph diagram on the left-hand side. Uh, in goes uh, x and it gets, in goes y. y gets duplicated because I'm using it twice and I'm gonna multiply x times y and I'm gonna multiply, add the result of that again with, with y. Um, but in the inverse direction, I'm gonna get parameters for the multiplication and for the uh, addition. And it's possible that I choose some parameter values such that this duplication function gets two different values for y. Um, and so in other words, like I can have inconsistency. I can, choose, I can choose parameter values which result in inconsistencies of the values of, of, for the values of y. To solve these inconsistencies in this case, I have to make sure that my theta one is equal to z minus theta two. When that is true, everything is fine, this is a valid, perfect parametric inverse, and it will reconstruct all of the values of x and y given some output. So in other words, you know, so why does this happen? One way to think about it is that when you run a program forward, it's just kind of like one way to go. But when you run in the inverse direction, there's all these choices that you have to make uh, about how to go backwards. And you can make choices which can go down parts of the program which just can't occur in reality. And so there's, it's kind of, it's a, it's a harder, harder problem going backwards. 
And so this is kind of one of the really challenging things and we haven't solved it, but one of the areas that we're moving into now is that maybe we can learn how to invert. And I don't have results in this, it's why you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you can figure it out. Uh, but one thing that is very cool is that we can actually generate a lot of data. And what this data uh, is derived from this other object, which we call a parameter generating function. So if we have a forward function, let's say the rendering, the rendering uh, algorithm, right? I can actually mechanically take some three-dimensional scene, run it through this thing called a parameter generating function, and output a set of parameters, which are almost like breadcrumbs, which would tell me exactly how to invert, you know, exactly the parameters which would be needed for the parameter inverse to recover this X, right? And so what that means is I can, if I've got some way to generate inputs to my, you know, to my function, I can generate, you know, an arbitrary large data set of pairs of X and thetas, which potentially could be used for some kind of inversion process or learning-based inversion process. But this is kind of what we're thinking about now. I'm going to move on to um, the final project that I'm going to talk about. And this is uh, perhaps the most closely related to, to neurosymbolic, uh, uh, neurosymbolic programming. And this is around data structure now. Sorry, and I'm going to quickly change. Thanks. So one of the things you find in programming languages are data structures. Um, you know, they're everywhere. You can't program without data structures. Uh, and it's one thing you don't really find in, in neural models, right? Like, you know, a, a list is very useful. A stack is very useful. Uh, the integer set is very useful. Even if you go to geometry, things like object mesh types are very useful. But there's no real correspondence in the world of, of machine or deep machine learning. Uh, and so one of the things, again, I started to explore in my PhD was Maybe like could we get the best of both worlds? And so, what is a data structure? Um, well, you know, if you there's many different ways to think about it, but uh, one way to think about it is defining some kind of interface, right? So, for example, if I take a number, what does it mean to be a number? Well, I have some structure with it, which is a number, and then I've got some operations which operate on that on that number type, right? Uh, and then there are some laws which describe what it means to be a valid number. Similarly, for a stack, uh, there is a you know there's a stack data structure. There's some operations, push and pop, and then there are some laws which define what it means to be a valid, valid stack. And actually, the, you know, the downstream implementation, maybe we don't care so much about. Um, as long as the implementation satisfies these laws, then we can call it a bona fide stack. And so this idea is, uh, you know, I think is very familiar to every computer scientist, uh, but it's also a kind of a deep idea in cognitive science, right? Which is that you can understand some kind of information processing system at different levels of analysis, right? There's the high level, uh, definition of you know what is the system trying to do then there's the algorithms by which it's doing it and then there's like the low level implementation whether that be on the machine or on or in a neural network or in or in or in the brain for example uh, and so one of the ideas i had was well what if we just try to keep this high level definition definition of a stack uh, and maybe let the low level uh, kind of implementation be learned and so we can construct a neural stack and this neural stack uh, has the same algebraic structure. It has some constant for uh, the empty stack. It has some operations, push and pop, which take this, take this uh, stack and transform it. Uh, and it must satisfy the same laws as any, any kind of stack. So how, you know, okay, so how, maybe that makes sense at some high level, but how do we actually you know, train this? And so the approach that I tried to take is to say, well, let's take a normal program like a kind of, you know, the kind of program that you would write every day, which uses some stack. Uh, and let's create an equivalent program, uh, which has, wherever I, use it, wherever I use this normal stack, let's replace that with a, a neural stack. And what I want to be true is that when I run both of these programs in parallel, there's some points at which they're observationally equivalent. Uh, and so basically, I, you know, to, 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 to make, you make that a little bit more concrete, um, we start, for example, with a stack. We've got a few different objects that we're going to parameterize and train. So we, we've got an empty stack, which is a constant. We've got a, fu a function for push, which is a neural network. We've got a function for pop, which is also a neural, ne neural network. And, and that's it. Um, and so we run both of these programs. In this case, these, you know, I've got some programs which just push stuff onto the stack and then pop them. Um, 
And I'm going to train my network such that at the times when I use my, use my stack, the output, the observational outputs are equivalent both in the real stack and this, this train stack. And from that, I can derive a loss function to make the neural stack, you know, basically emulate the, the real stack. And so the cool thing is that, you know, again, this works. So like what I'm showing you here on the left-hand side is an image of what the system has learned to be as the empty stack. Um, and so this is, you know, I, don't, you know, I can't fully interpret this, but this is its particular representation of how it thinks an empty stack should be represented. And on the, on the top, I've got these MNIST, MNIST digits. So in this example, I'm gonna be pushing on digits onto the stack and then popping them. And so the first thing to show here is that uh, it works in a sense that I, when I push on uh, 864 and then I pop three times, I get back 468. So it works as a stack as intended. The more interesting thing is that if you look at the internal representation, we've got this model is, is, has to learn how to encapsulate all of these digits inside uh, its, you know, its representation of a stack, but it also has to remember the order in which it did it, right? And so if you look closely, you can see it's kind of interlaced, you know, four and six and eight in a particular way, which, you know, I, again, I can't fully interpret, uh, but to operate as a stack such that when I then pull, you know, uh, when I then, you know, either push or pop from the stack, I get back the, the correct, the, the correct, sorry, the correct object. And so these, all of these things are learned simultaneously, both the push, the pop, and the empty stack, such that they all work together in the way that you would you know, expect, according to this notion of observational equivalence, as I talked about before. And you can do the same thing for a queue, uh, and, it, and it works, but the internal representation is different. Um, again, hard to interpret, but uh, you know, it's doing some kind of, I don't know, uh, maybe you tell me, but for each different, Data structure, you, you find a different internal representation. It also somewhat depends upon the architecture of the, you know, the functions that you use for the operators. Um, but it seems to work pretty well you know, for all the different kinds of architectures that, that we've run at so far. One natural question is, um, does it generalize? Right? So if I've you know, a stack in the, in the common sense, you can push on some arbitrary number of digits and pop arbitrarily. But this internal representation of a, of a stack is finite, so it can't, you know, it can't capture an unbounded number of objects. And so one natural question is like, how much can it capture? So in this case, we just pushed on uh, in order eight, eight, four, six, one, three, four, uh, three, nine, one, and then popped. And this was a stack trained just to push and pop at most three digits. And you can see that after three, it, you know, going in the, in the backwards direction, it kind of catches four, but then it slowly degrades, uh, you know, as you, go, as you go beyond that. So it's a kind of an approximate, um, neural stack that works, you know, at least is optimized to the distribution in which you, which you train on. Uh, I don't know if there's like some upper bound, uh, well, there is some upper bound, but I don't know what exactly that, that would be for this particular architecture. And an interesting question is, could you, could you make this an unbounded stack through some kind of architectural, architectural change? And so 